here's glad it's no everybody we've got Nero the witch here our first guest how are you doing Nero I'm doing great how are you I am doing pretty good um so we are going to discuss the topic of magic and how it pertains to this day and age how it pertains to spirituality across religions so what is your opinion on that I mean uh what how do you feel your practice has been relevant to other people of all different faiths well after studying for about seven years, just how systems work and systems of magic correlate to one another, you start to see and find different similarities or even their um, things that are congruent with one another to how they interlink a faith to one other person's systems. So I've studied Abrahamic, Anokian, Catholic, whatever may have you have seen it and I've heard it. But I've always had a semblance of this connection to spirit that really brings each of them into their own essence, just the different ways of how they do their own workings. Sounds like uh, what you're saying is that there's a universal spiritual principle that we're all in different phases of discovering, different parts of discovering, which is what it sounds like. Is that correct? That is very much correct. You're writing on the money. Um, it's why <clears throat> a lot of the time I can't really seem to solidify myself into one because it's it's all really the same thing. So it's kind of interchangeable in their own dynamics, just the different conditions along with their principles and the morals that they have and hold are just different in how they form their expression of spirit. So it might be what you're what you're call what you would call going eclectic. That's why so many practitioners are considering themselves eclectic practitioners nowadays, and why there's such a huge interfaith movement that is opening up to the fact that metaphysics is a viable route for understanding science and religion. I mean, we have the Eastern wisdom that has come over to the West. Now we've now we've pretty much solidified that it wasn't hoo ha. It was actually very very scientifically relevant. It caused major changes in the brain when people meditate or practice yoga. Um, that there are universal and cosmic principles embedded in all of those uh, hieroglyphics and all of those ancient systems. So people are starting to see, okay, you know, maybe it is really relevant regardless of where it came from or whether it fits my little section of, uh, of religion. Yeah, it's Opening especially up. relevant into that because the things is that people study the subconscious along with symbolism, sigils. And all those play a huge part in how they express intention and inventions of time and space in those same objects and has physical changes on the subconscious, what the subconscious takes on and changes within the body, mind, and soul. It's math, and it's just that we have so little understanding of how broad and extraordinary that mathematics is that we have magic, we have mysticism, we have a way of in interacting with the unknown. So Chris, um, can you introduce your book and um, start introducing uh, your um, your way of life and everything that you would like to discuss about this? Sure, um, my name is Chris Allen. Um, a little bit about me is, is I'm an ordained um, minister with an LGBTQ group called the Fellowship of the Phoenix. I am one of the founding members and, and a priest here in Chicago. Um, I'm also by day a massage therapist. And um, so I know a lot about anatomy, the body, self-healing and the, you know, those things. I've been doing um, this type of healing and work being like 
and in paganism, um, magic and, and energy healing for about um, almost uh, 30 years. So 29 years, I started back in 1992. Um, I am published, I mean, obviously, um, I have a series of, of books, a loosely based on the shamanic three words of the upper world, the underworld, and now the other world. Um, my new book is called um, Other World Ecstatic Witchcraft um, for the Spirits of the Land. And what it's about is it's a combination, it's a combination between the um, shamanic philosophies and old world witchcraft so when we think of the old world witchcraft we think of of animal familiars we think of shape-shifting we think of a covenant with the fairies evocative of elements of the spirit world that they used to interact with regularly yes yeah, so fairies, elves, and dragons, and nature spirits, animal spirits, things like that. So I have a question for you regarding those because a lot of a lot of people watching will be like, okay, he's talking about fairies, elves, and spirits. What are they? Is is he talking about something that doesn't exist or that is fantasy or is it reality? So I, I'd like to frame that and then get your response. Um, so my perception on this is that there have been many creatures evolving on earth many creatures created and evolved uh in the garden of of earth that we exist in and that when they die they evolve and become many different types of creatures so when we say dragons when we say elves when we say fairies we are discussing real entities we are mm -hmm. discussing real spiritual beings that have evolved and lived their life in this dimension and can visit us in the spirit plane am i correct in assuming that that's your perspective? um yeah, uh, yes more yes and um they can actually visit us in the physical plane as well to the um, ancient pagans, they didn't, I mean, there's lots of lore and stories about how, how the spiritual beings, even the gods, would actually you know, manifest on the physical plane. Yeah, the difference is, is that most of the time spirits don't manifest in hard physical form. Like, for example, the word the word elf actually comes from the Northern European uh, Scandinavian word of alfar, and alfar translates to either it's like bright shining fog or mist. Mm -hmm. So mm, they would manifest, but it was more of a fog. Um, did you have any anything to add about that, or ask uh, Chris about that? Just um... yeah, definitely. Um with how spirits interact with the spirit world and how we've always interacted with them in the physical back in you know the ancient days or the days <laughs> long past us we've always seen people have examples of naga or fairies or nymphs all those type of spirits interacting with modern age humanity yeah. and actually have an interchangeable effect on how they see reality how they see themselves so it's always been this idea that correlates to something bigger than us and bigger than the world that we can see them in. And with how we see them now in this day and age, it's kind of like this example of, are, are they here? Is it just my mind? Is it my body just correlating those things when in actuality it's just, it's all those things that are fine. So the astonishing thing that we have now is we have scientific evidence that these beings actually really did exist. I mean, we have skeletons that are humongous, you know, human skeletons that are the size of giants. We have in archaeological digs all different types of humans, some that look like fairies. So, mm -hmm. so I mean, uh, it, later on in this broadcast, I might actually reference to the reader some of that scientific data because, I mean, if you watch Ancient Aliens, you know, they, they go over all of this, that there actually is scientific facts behind 
all the myths and legends we are discussing. So Chris, I have a question uh, for you also um, about the shape-shifting element, mm -hmm. um, which is a bit of a divergence on the topic, but is kind of related since you said that the ancient ancient tribes and especially modern practitioners mm -hmm. can practice shape-shifting. Let's to be clear, um, is this spiritual shape-shifting where you're altering your identity and your way of inhabiting your body, or are you talking about actual metabolic physical shape-shifting? So, um, yes and no at the same time. So, um, in the book, I, in the lore, let's start there. In the lore, they do talk about how witches and shamans actually shapeshift. However, um, I've ever actually seen a physical, full on shapeshift, like I've ever actually seen a person turn into a tiger or a wolf. Yeah, or yeah. The, main, the main issue that people will be wondering about is, has he actually transformed into a tiger? How shapeshifting works, you can do it on several levels. The mental level, of course, is the easiest, like, uh, close your eyes and imagine yourself to be a bear and you see yourself as a bear. Yeah. Astral is a little bit d different and uh, to the experience of magician and witch and so forth, you know the difference between your uh, mental body and your astral body, but to the beginner it's a little bit different. It's I would describe it as a little bit, a little bit more tangible. Think of your body as in, as in dreams, um, shamanic journeying, things like that. And then to actually shape shift using your astral body. Yes, you just think it, uh, but you have to tune in to, to your astral body. Emotions absolutely do affect your astral, but they are not the same. They're not quite the same phenomenon. No, yeah, they're, they're not, not inherently the same at all. Yeah. So when we tend, we tap into our animal brain, we're tapping into that aspect of our consciousness that's survival, strength, energy or chi or whatever you want to call it prana um the ability to heal faster and uh the ability to perform better uh, physically heighten your senses so what happens is is that like for example if, you, if you're being attacked or if someone's attacking a your child or a friend or your, your family, you go into this primal rage, right? Part of that is it's stimulated by your adrenal glands. So think of it this way. When you start up a, your car, mm -hmm. you have to have that, you have to have that fire. But, but it's the engine, you have to have the spark, but it's the engine that actually makes the car go. So yeah. your adrenal glands, kicks it in the, the reptilian brain and you're and you slightly shapeshift. And yeah. shapeshift doesn't have to mean I'm a bear. It means it doesn't necessarily concretely, but it alters the electrochemistry. It alters the neural wiring. It alters yes. the astral and the mental and the etheric shape of your of your being and yes. allows you to enter that state almost physically, almost completely. Physically. Yeah, because you had to take it to a notation of at least an example as to what you guys are talking about with you know, the, a pregnant woman seeing her child underneath a car basically lifts up the car yeah, off I've the ground. Or, you know, a guy who sees his mom in a birthing building and physically climbs 12 stories high to get his mom out the building and he climbs. What ties into this is that that part of our brain, that, that brain stem and the primal system, the cerebellum, all the, all the parts of the reticular activating system, which we're talking about the reptilian brain, they all operate on, a, on mystic codes. They operate on mathematical principles, but the reason we call it magic and, and, and use it that way is because that aspect of creation speaks that language. So when we are tapping as magicians or witches or as any practitioner of, of metaphysical arts, and we are tapping into that, from what I understand, 
we are literally accessing a different form of intelligence living inside of us. So there is a thing in, in, in biology that they say you have a second brain in full. What that means is that you, you, uh, your spine mm -hmm. um, is actually a intelligence of its own. And yeah. It can it control several of the uh, nerves and body functions in the body. So I can see that intelligence, but you know, one of the things that is the difference of, uh, between an, an adrenaline rush and shape-shifting is that shape-shifting is purposeful. Yeah. The animal brain is what you want to uh, tap into because there's all this like, raw power. The other thing you have to understand is in um, in the philosophy of shape sh shifting, we all have a spirit animal. It's who we are. We're all connected. And it isn't an outside spirit. Yeah. It's who you are. So Nira, I'd like to ask you a few questions about this. Um, we were talking about uh, about just generally having those animal spirits in it, in our in our existence and as a part of us. Um, what is your experience with how that works out in the scientific realm? How I mean, like for for instance, for me, I look at it as that ninety nine percent of our genetics is the same with those animals. So we are sort of an aspect of them. We are all in some way one flesh, and that's how I look at it. What is your take on that? Well. That is exactly that aspect okay. because it's the reptilian brain. The reptilian yeah. brain holds that raw essence of power and essence of how we connect to, to literal primal strength. But yeah. we used to be animals. So for us to exclude ourselves from that dynamic would be kind of blasphemous of us. It, it, but, it would be, yeah. Yeah. We've always had scientists magicians and sorcerers as people to go to to fix your kids, to help cure an illness. Those things are what metaphysicists or metaphysical people, sorcerers, witches, warlocks, we're originally doing. Did, you know, yeah, were originally doing. That was their that was their primal role. And, and as unfortunately, they, we've yeah. kind of castrated that role by turning them into clinical psychiatrists and not really opening those those modern allopathic met methods up to the spiritual. Like you're saying, yes. you know, we've lost half of the equation of the healing process. And that is another way that it is applicable to our modern lives is that there are some things that science as we have it cannot reasonably explain. They yes. Can't. And so we need somebody to interface with that spiritual world, with that mysticism. And yes. if we don't have somebody to do it, we get lost. I think that's one of the reasons why society is so lost right now is we've lost our tribal elders. We've lost our tribal mentality and we've lost our healers. And it's it's definitely those aspects. I actually really like what Chris Allen said about the word shamanism and how that in itself is just a dictation of people who are ordained in that faith, who are ordained to do those things. Yeah. Right now you hear it in, you know, other people's words are like, well, I'm, I'm a shaman, but it, it really disregards the actuality and the totality of what that word really embodies, the responsibility well. embodies, yeah. yes, especially those like things. Like I said, it's like people saying, I'm a rabbi, and you know, you have to have specialized training, and you also have to be recognized in your community. And that's not to say if someone goes, oh, I practice shamanic techniques, I think that that's completely fine to say. I don't think it's fine to say I'm a shaman. So where do you draw the line um, with people exploring their spirituality, you know, in, in ancient traditions? What, you know, where's the authorship in there? Who has who has control over those those titles? So, yeah, that's actually a, a great um, question because there is this whole thing about gatekeeping, which I hate, I hate everything about it, uh, censorship, um, control. Uh, but to say I'm a hoodoo teacher or a voodoo priest or priestess, that actually takes recognition from that community. However, 
to throw a, a wrench in that socket <laughs> because I like to throw wrenches and sockets and things and screw things yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, I know. I think um, all three of us do. <laughs> a lot of hoodoo uh, comes. Let me rephrase. There are certain aspects of hoodoo that come directly from European witchcraft. That being said, it's evolved from that to where it's become its own tradition. Yeah. Um, plus, there are similar things that, like a, using a doll, using a candle, using an oil lamp, using incense. Some of those are just common things. You can't well, say, you can't yeah. use stage, you can't use incense, you can't use a doll. That's hoodoo. I'm like, well, no, it's also European whisper. Somebody can take on whatever title they choose, but that they're not necessarily going to be regarded that way by other people. So, Nira, I'd like to talk to you because you have a lot of experience with this topic. Um, uh, I know that root working is has a lot of biblical, uh, a lot of biblical connections. It is very, uh, it's very traditional in a lot of ways. But there are also elements of conjure which are extremely, extremely experimental. Incorporate mm -hmm. every religion, incorporate every faith, every path, um, every race. So I'd like your your official word on on that element of it. Yeah, of course. Um, I kind of vibe with what Chris Allen said about how interlaying the Hoodoo tradition has European influences as a connection that transforms the faith entirely. The only difference is that we have to remind ourselves about the intention that it was used behind for African American people. So. Yeah. It's it's was used as a survivalist tradition. People say, well, I'm a hoodooist, or I do hoodoo, and they're white person. It's they catch that flash because it's not religiously for them. It's was for them to to be against them. So for any working that they do, it's not something that they attribute or can do. But then again, it isn't really attributed to the practitioner as in this day and age. It's kind of like a, you know, same thing on the on constitution of, well, I'm a shaman and this is what I do as a shaman. You have to be really recognized by that community to, to take on those principles. But only, you know, those who don't have that access or information to that don't really understand. However, there are some universal terms like uh, yes. conjure, conjuration. You know, somebody can lay claim to using talismans or being a mystic or a conjurer without, and, and, the, and say that they use and draw on root working in hoodoo and that they draw on witchcraft and that they draw on shamanism for wisdom. But yeah. that's, that's because those are general terms that anybody can lay claim to if they're practicing that. Yeah, um, of so course, it's, it's, it's a different aspect. You know, when you say you're drawing from that wisdom, you're actually drawing information from them. It's not like yeah. you're actively involved. You're allowing yourself to be influenced by what that tradition practices. Part of the balancing act of being an eclectic practitioner is like, okay, first off, I have all these different forces pulling on my interest. I'm, and you know, I think that's part of being in our modern culture, we are all mixes and patchworks of ancient traditions up from all over the place. So, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, so there, there has to be some sort of meeting ground, I think. And I think because most people are activating their genetics through magic, through mysticism, they're starting to realize, oh my gosh, I don't belong to any one tradition. I'm kind of part of every it's tradition. Tradition. And it's hard for them to reconcile that with the traditions they feel drawn to and the traditions themselves and what credentials those traditions demand of them. Yeah, that's exactly why I was talking to you earlier about creating that system. Because yeah. the thing is, is that besides one, yeah, besides the one thing that we all have in together about a religious aspect, it's our difference in principality and moralities. But we have systems that are already in place in the mundane world, like the internet. The internet's the first place that we can think of that interlinks a dimensional cortex. Our, our, it's it's kind of like we interlay everything that we have about our culture and ourselves onto the internet. It's so you'll see things telepathic web, basically. Yeah. yeah. So we're we're kind of already interlinked by how we think and understand one another and expression of ideas. That place is a interwoven web of consciousness. But the thing is, is that we don't have that dimensionally through religious context or religious aspects of how we see each other, how we see one another, how we see 
our principles and interlay them into one another. Yeah. So with the system in place, it'll help not only bring that out of people, bring them into the foundation of where that lies and not only where things can truly thrive in, but where how we can thrive as a community. love chaos and magic. I think chaos and magic is Pretty one awesome. of the things that it taught me how to create my own spells and create my own magic That's and to really about. trust my own intuition, you know, because in chaos and magic, you're sitting around, you're like, I have a phone, I got a book. How can I do magic with this? I love yeah. that. I think that's important. But yeah, that's, that's my original path personally, even though right. I've changed and added a lot of other elements and ordered myself. Originally, I got my start in, in chaos theory and chaos magic because it yeah. was modern, it was eclectic, and it was exciting. It allowed you to tap into all those primal technologies and put them in modern terms without feeling like you were you know, it had to be part of a group that, um, right. that, you know, that you didn't belong to. If I need a soul retrieval, I'm like, hey, I want to, I'm feeling a certain way. I think I need a soul retrieval. What do you think? If you haven't had that training and you're like, well, I don't you know. You're like, well, I'll, I'll wing it, you know, and you don't know what you're doing. So, yeah. And, and so no. when people, when people label something, they expect certain things attached to that label. So respecting the labels and not misusing those labels actually ties into magic itself, which is very powerfully connected to words and vibrations. You know, the type of words and vibrations that you use are really important to what you actually get out of right. out of out of your process. Um, so Nero, have you encountered any sort of? Um, and I mean, obviously, you've encountered a lot of prejudice between mixing your your traditional faith. With modern, with modern values and science, how what, what's your take on all this? Like mixing, mixing beliefs. I mean, I know you're your own thing. I know that. Yeah, I already um, know you are your own religion, which is quite extraordinary. Well, that's the thing. Um, I've been taught Alexandrian magic for four years, a part of my training. So I've actually been taught Orthodox magic. That's it's a part of my religious structure. It's just that. Once I started to openly explore how to combine things, how to truly really openly explore the essence of not only chaos, magic, void, magic, all that stuff, you know, I'm a, I'm a bibliophile. It's what I do. You know, I still encounter, you know, people who kind of have that idea of, well, I'm a shaman because I can do this because I learned how to be a shaman. But in correlations, they don't really understand what that word means and yeah. the intentions that were behind it and what it implements. And over time, when you introduce um, the word techno-shamanism, really hit a point for me because the thing is, is that like techno-shamanism is a part of memetics and how memetic ideas exchange information through DNA, but not through the respect of that word or title or connection to that title that we have to take an attribution of what that is, break it down. You know. In other words, so what you guys are saying really is that there, that you need to be careful how you define what you're saying and whether you have knowledge to back up the title. Regardless of whether you're making a title up as, as part of your own practice or mixing titles, you have to make sure that you're doing so with respect to the titles you're using and what they entail so that right. you're not just falsifying yeah. Well, yourself. Yeah, think of that as the principal aspect of us doing witchcraft or magic entirely. We have to be mindful about the words and the intentions that we set at the beginning of our basis of magic. It's taught to us as the semblance of what we do first. But if we're not being that aspect to the T of what we actually create ourselves to be, then we're literally breaking the first code of magic that we were set yeah. to do. You know, it's your intention, right? Exactly, it's your intention, and not understanding the intentions behind the words that we created and what they evolved themselves, shape shift into harmonically. It just breaks down what they were actually used for and disrespects the word entirely. Well, and that, and that that ties into why a lot of people, you know, try and cast a spell or perform a ritual, and it doesn't work for them, and that's because they aren't actually resonating and experiencing the knowledge and wisdom that they're invoking. It's just like the, the ritual of the pentagram. If you don't understand that the ritual of the pentagram is invoking and enforcing positive evolving life force for the human body and a balance of the elements, you, you, you'll just be like, I'm drawing a star. 
You know, you yeah. won't you won't know that you're that you're invoking positive, healthy energy of right. a certain spectrum right. into your body. You know, you have to yeah. understand what you're doing and visualize it and, and have the codes memorized in your soul to really, really tap it. people be like well i did a hex or i did a spell and it didn't work but i'm having all this bad stuff happen to me now it's because you disrespect it. yeah and then you also you know? have to look at the, uh, the the law of uh of least resistance where when people set the butterfly effect into motion when they set energy into motion when they program reality there are byproducts of that that might actually be that the spell worked it just didn't work the way you expect you expect it to know it's about service and if yeah. you don't think it's about service you, you ain't doing it because exactly um and the thing it's is a, it's a, it's an office of trust that you have absolutely even, yes, even it's very it, much so yeah, it is very even, much so even, even if you're even if you're practicing chaos magic you're setting forces into motion that influence the world and therefore have to have a strict code of ethics even if you're using chaos as your as your uh, you know uh, you're incorporating many different elements that can be perceived as chaotic or right. unconventional. You still are wielding power and therefore have some obligation to have your own code of conduct so that you don't cause problems for yourself at the very least. When I do readings for people. I explain to them the science behind what I'm doing. I say, first off, I'm not a superhuman when I use my intuition to figure out things about you. I am using the principles of nature and science. They are just, I just don't fully have an explanation for it. And you don't have a full explanation for how I do it, but I'm tapping the mathematical intuition in my mind to realize information that you might not have access to. But if, if you meet somebody in a practice that says they are this and gives you fluff, and you're you're being scammed you know and there's a yeah. lot of scam artists on there and if they can't admit to you their flaws or where their abilities are limited they're not really genuine practitioners yeah they don't course. know what they're doing and so because somebody that is trying to use magic and is trying to use spirituality and is trying to use science and technology to evolve in their direction and pursue their own goals uh, for spiritual evolution and become something more than human, that is seen as subversive by most people when really actually it's kind of the point of life. I mean, we grow and we get older and learn how to drive a car. We didn't know how to do that. That was alien to us. Look at all the things around us that are <laughs> alien to what it is to originally be a human and tell me that transhumanism is not the course we naturally take as humans. We build up, grow, we evolve, and we use tools to create all sorts of things from our brains. So, mm. you know, but but every single time in history when something new like that has come along, it's always been seen as subversive. And that's part of the, the cosmic ritual itself is, you know, you got you got this 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 person who's got a value system diverges from that value system, starts their own path. And it's the same old story. I think we've gone over how this applies to our modern reality and how it applies, you know, yes. that this does. You know, um, I think that we have covered a lot of topics today. Um, I might correspond with you guys a little bit later um, for some more clarification and, and um, information. But it's been really great talking to you guys. Um, thank you so much. And everyone, this has been the Pathwalkers Gathering interview with Chris Allen and Nero the Witch. All right. All right. See you guys later. Bye, thank everyone. You. See you later. Bye.